this is something that I did as part of the TRB. Um, I said, okay, look, what about temperature change? Uh, what does that likely mean in terms of transportation? Well, that means it could be a higher maximum temperature, perhaps a lower minimum temperature, a higher range uh, in, in, involved. What does that mean in the short term to us? Well, probably not much in terms of how we do pavement design or structural, uh, but in the long term, I would suggest that may have a significant impact in terms of how we design our pavement and structures. Um, what about changing precipitation levels, more rain? Uh, well, uh, over the short term, it certainly could affect how we look at pavement and drainage design, maybe stronger attention to foundation conditions, uh, and I would suggest a more probabilistic approach in terms of how we look at design floods. Over the long term, I think this fundamentally makes us rethink about how we design foundations. Uh, if in fact you're likely to have a much higher uh, intensity or a saturation level of water in those parts of the country where that's the case. Wind loads, stronger winds are predicted. Uh, what does that mean? Well, over the short term, probably not much. Uh, most of our big bridges, for example, are done through tunnel testing, et cetera. But over the longer term, that may mean for our bigger bridges, we have to have stronger materials and better ways of designing those bridges in those locations where you're gonna have strong winds. Big issues, storm surges and greater wave height. Over the short term, well, we've got issues. The bridges that were redesigned in the Gulf Coast I showed you that were destroyed were redesigned four feet higher than what they had been designed originally to take into account future storm surges, okay? You're, I think you're gonna see more and more of that in the longer term of taking into account potential changes uh, as we go along. This is an example from England. Um, the Europeans are so far ahead of us, it's terrible, uh, as are the New Zealanders. Um, this is their study. This is their Federal Highway Administration, basically. They said here are the key issues that they're going to be facing in England with regard to climate changes. You see increase in air temperatures, types of things that I already talked about. Um, that may mean secondary things. That means that there could be a longer growing season. In order for cutting the grass, that means they may have a reduction in soil moisture. They could have change in groundwater level. They could have more flooding. Uh, they, I guess this is England, so it's foggy. Uh, it could change the number of foggy days that they have. Um, and the frequency of extreme storm surges. So they've looked at this in terms of what this means to their highway system, and then came up with, well, well, forget that, it's this, whatever. They then came up with saying, here's what we need to do. I'm trying to get through this quick, because the good stuff is still coming. Okay, we need to future-proof our designs in the context of what may happen in the future. We may have to retrofit. Of course, this all takes money. Um, we, may, we need to develop contingency plans in the event that this bridge or this link in our highway network goes up down because of flooding or whatever the case is, what are our contingency plans? We need to update how we operate our systems, we clearly need to monitor, and we need to do research. When in doubt, always do research. Um, and those three, SHARP is the Strategic Highway Research Program, NCHRP is the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, WFL is Western Federal Lands. Um, th that's not English, that's U.S., but I just put that there for a note that I'm, I'm the PI, Principal Investigator, on those three projects that are all looking at climate adaptation issues and its impact on transportation in the United States. Um, so research is a real issue with regard to these particular issue, uh, areas. Here's a flowchart. This is a flowchart that I think more of us are gonna be looking at in the future. This is kind of is a preliminary flowchart of how you do adaptation planning for transportation. In fact, I'm now doing this in the Gulf Coast for the Gulf Coast 2 study that I mentioned before. We have to identify what are our critical assets in the, in the network, okay? We can't possibly cover 100% of the network with everything. We don't have the money, but don't have the resources. But where are there the critical assets? What are the predominant changes in climate that are likely going to occur in that area? What are the impacts of those climate changes that are gonna be on those particular assets? And what then is the vulnerability of that highway system or that highway link to potential changing conditions? Conduct a risk appraisal, and I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. You are gonna see, in my opinion, more and more risk-based assessments of future investments in the transportation system based where risk is to what extent are we uh, possibly seeing the likelihood of changing issues, climate issues for example, and what does that mean in terms of how we design. So conduct a risk appraisal on what that means, identify a trigger level, which means you know we're not gonna do everything now because it hasn't happened, but at some point the conditions may reach a level, a threshold level where we need to do something. That's a trigger, now we've gotta do something. Um, I'd figure out what the feasibility and cost is of doing something. Look at the different types of strategies for the different types of assets that we're responsible for. Uh, then we either change design standards, we change operating strategy, we change maintenance practices, we change construction practices, we do whatever it is we want to do, and then we go back and identify vulnerabilities, all good planning processes have a feedback loop where you start over again, okay? This is, at this point in time, is the framework that we're using in the NCHRP project to think about how we do adaptation planning for the highway system in the United States. And you're gonna see more and more of this as you go along. 
And from a research perspective, this is what you're going to see more and more of, I believe. More of a probabilistic approach towards what, these, what the likelihood is of some of these changes occurring. Uh, that's the normal distribution in terms of some of the issues. What does that mean in terms of the types of risk? And what does that mean in terms of some of the impacts? Uh, this comes from England, where they basically are looking at change in uh, annual precipitation, change in annual temperatures, and have a, a probability distribution in the between there, but where they think the probability of certain uh, occurrences are likely going to occur, in this case is inflows into a river basin. You're going to see more and more of this being developed for our approaches towards uh, um, uh, infrastructure. And New York City has done a very simple, virtually certain, extremely likely, very likely, likely, more likely, which again kind of is a subjective assessment of what they think is going to occur. And then you also have, uh, this comes from uh, Victoria, which is Australia, um, is to say, well, low, medium, or high. You know, I love these things. I love them. I use full circles, empty circles, half circles. They use low, medium, high, one to five, three stars, zero stars. You know, subjective, but at least gives some sense in this particular case of what level of risk is associated with certain things occurring and the, the vulnerability of all of that. So in conclusion, Bob, I, I'm almost done. In conclusion, what are my conclusions, okay? Let's look first at greenhouse gas emissions, okay? Transportation is absolutely critical to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Public policy, people in Washington are gonna be focusing on the transportation system to be a major contributor to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, okay? There are multiple dimensions to this, as I mentioned to you before, vehicles, fuels, VMT reduction system operations, construction. We are gonna get our biggest bang for the buck on vehicle and fuel technologies, I'm convinced, but it's not gonna be enough. We're gonna to have to do something else. Uh, with respect to technology, I didn't say this before, but most experts on the battery side of things think that we're in a transition period of 20 to 25 years, that we won't have a battery yet that's marketable and cost effective and, and all sorts of good things until 20 to 25 years from now. And their question is, what do we do over the next 20 to 25 years to get to that point where they believe that technology will be available? Um, I believe that a lot of initiatives uh, from now on in this country, I suspect when Congress passes a new federal law, there's going to be a requirement to do greenhouse gas emissions analysis as part of investment analyses. Uh, and so you're going to see more and more of that. And as I said before, pricing, I think, is going to be a key issue if you're really interested in reducing vehicle miles traveled. I showed you before, it's going to be a package of strategies. Uh, and as I suggested, it's already happening, that you're going to see these things being required as part of the planning process and the NEPA requirements, which is the project development. For adaptation, I think the New Zealanders have it right, which is don't, don't claim the sky is falling and, and get all upset and lose sleep at night, uh, but let's systematically take a look at where the vulnerabilities are and let's figure out when the appropriate time is to do something and then do it. Uh, retrofit when appropriate. I think risk assessment is absolutely essential. We don't do much of that in transportation, but our earthquake people and our fire people do. How can we apply those types of techniques to transportation? More flexibility in design, make sure that there's network redundancies. I firmly believe, if you, and you know what asset management is, uh, I strongly believe that the logical place for this adaptation issue in most state departments of transportation is in their asset management programs. That's where you monitor, that's where you keep up with the condition of your assets, that's where I think you need to incorporate uh, this issue, issue of concern for adaptation. From our systems perspective, I mentioned risk-oriented probabilistic design procedures. Seems nationally at least that wave action and storm surge is one of the key issues. Not just design, but what do we do about land use? What do we do about other things? And then of course, when in doubt, research, always important. And the final slide is that there was a report that came out last month from the Transportation Research Board. Uh, I chaired this committee, uh, which in essence said, here is the research that we believe is necessary in the area of climate change, both greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation. Uh, and so if any of you are interested in interesting research topics in this area, I would refer you to that report because it has a very long list of questions that we think that need to be answered to be able to prepare ourselves for this particular challenge. And with that, I will finally be done. Okay, Bob? Okay, and, and thank you very much. Um,